We're going to continue on with reduced order modeling, and in particular thinking about proper orthogonal decomposition and how to build low dimensional models of partial differential equations. So this is from chapter 11 of the book, Data Driven Science and Engineering, Kutz and Brunton. Databook, UW.com has all the code I'll talk about today, as well as notes and extensive uh, other resources for you to play around with in the context of this kind of uh, kind of work on reduced order modeling. So uh, just as a reminder, we're, we're thinking about reduced order models, ROMs, and we're thinking about taking a system that is very high dimensional. Uh, so simulating that system can be very costly. So for instance, when you discretize a PDE, you may have billions of different discrete points that you have to simulate now as a billion degree system of ODEs. So this is very costly, and the idea is to try to trade that out to some new representation of the data in which you can now simulate that at a fraction of the cost of the full state space system. Okay? So that's the idea of ROMs, is to find that coordinate system in which this can happen, and to project your data or project your model into that subspace, which is advantageous for simulation purposes to give you that uh, leverage in terms of shrinking the computation dime down significantly. Um, this lecture in particular, the two previous lectures are laying down some of the foundations about how to find that. In particular, the way we find that subspace is through the singular value decomposition, where we take snapshots of the data of some high resolution PDE. So we're going to have to do some expensive computation first. But the idea is we do a short burst of an expensive computation, find the subspace which is optimal to embed that data, then build a Galerkin POD model in that subspace. So I talked about that in the last lecture, and what I want to do in this lecture is to actually contextualize this in terms of an example system, which is this one here, which is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and I want to do a POD decomposition and looking at soliton dynamics. So here's the model. It's a Schrodinger equation is the linear part, and now you have this nonlinearity here, so this is the nonlinear Schrodinger, so a linear part. Nonlinear part, this has some very interesting dynamics, and we're going to look mostly at just what are some of the canonical soliton dynamics that are uh, quite interesting and, and well studied uh, historically. Okay, so that's the model. And again, part of the goal here will be to say if I simulate this system, uh, then what I want to do is to try to figure out how to project it into a basis set and approximate it in a new basis set size that's going to come from the SVD. And then all I need to do then is watch the evolution of how the, co the AFT is the coefficients telling me how much of, that, uh, of those basis modes are, what's happening to them in time, and so the idea is this here will give me an ability to compute that. So the low rank dynamics is to put this into the governing equations, which is generically done here. So this is a, a representation of now the dynamics on the AFT space, which the hope is that if you did the simulation in a high dimensional space, that you find some rank R approximation. And so now this is a R dimensional set of differential equations to be computing right here. Okay, so that's going to be our reduced order model. And then I'm going to also show that, at least in this specific example, we can actually make some pretty nice progress in developing this model out and showing how it works in, in, in practice. Uh, in fact, you can do analytics on this one, which is very nice. So I want to show how that all works out and how you produce such a model here, which is this low rank model for the system. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to move into a code, and the code is going to solve that nonlinear Schrodinger equation. I'm going to walk through the code, and then I'm going to show you what the results are uh, here, and then talk about uh, how we might actually then l interpret the results we get from that, and also interpret the results from the model reduction. All right, so here we are. This is the code here. Uh, we're going to start off up at the top lines here. I'm defining a domain, L equals 40, so this thing's going to go from a domain size being negative 20 to 20, and you'll see the simulation results in a minute, so I'm just pick that out. There's 512 points, so I'm going to first solve this using a Fourier spectral method to solve this nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and then we're going to look for how do we go about then taking that data and doing a reduction. So, 
Size of the domain is 40, 512 points. I define a domain x2, which is goes from negative 20 to 20 and n plus 1 points. I throw away the last point because it's periodic boundary conditions. I'm using Fourier modes after all. Then x is the first 1 through n points. So that's my discretization of the spatial domain I'm going to work in. Now, in that spatial domain, the Fourier modes have these wave numbers here, k. Remember, the Fourier transform believes you're working on a 2 pi periodic domain. So here, the 2 pi over L is a rescaling because I'm working on a domain size L. Now this rescales up to the size 2 pi, for which prepares it to go to the Fourier transform. Here are the wave numbers. The wave numbers are like cosine 1x, cosine 2x, cosine 3x. Okay? Um, I'm going to solve it from time 0 to time 21. And here, uh, sorry, from 0 to 2 pi with 21 slices of time. Okay, so I'm going to go over a 2 pi period, take 21 slices, that's going to be my data matrix. And what I want to do with that data matrix is construct a low rank representation, which I can leverage to build low rank models. Now I'm going to do two simulations in particular. The first one is I'm going to take here simulation of the one, what's called the one soliton, which is you simulate a hyperbolic secant with the amplitude being 1. So set x is what's going to come in here. We're going to take a Fourier transform of that. That's going to be an initial condition for this OD solver, which is going to now march it forward, solving in the Fourier domain. When I get back out, I inverse Fourier transform, build the snapshots up in the original state space. I also do this again with n equals 2. So now it just has an amplitude 2 in front of the set hyperbolic secant. And so this is going to be the simulation. Let's look at the right-hand side of what nonlinear Schrodinger looks like. This is as about as simple as it gets. Here it is. You call the right-hand side function. You bring in your, your initial conditions, the time you're going to solve it for. Bring in your wave numbers k. Here's the second derivative. There's the nonlinear term. Okay? So fairly simple code to run. Uh, and this is a pretty standard like PD solve that you would do with spectral methods. Okay, so all that code is available on the website, so you can download it, play around with it, uh, and generate this kind of data. Now, you can run this, and in fact, I'm just going to come back to the slides because I think we can see these runs a little bit better just from the slides. So if you run that code, here are some of the results that you get. What I'm showing you now is the one soliton, and that two soliton. And what you're looking at is the top panels here is the evolution, it's the absolute value of the, of the field, mod u squared, function of x and time. So the n equals one soliton, this thing is a nonlinear wave that holds itself together and it takes this hyperbolic secant form and just keeps flying along. Now by the way, it's not stationary. This, the phase itself is rotating. So I've plotted the absolute value, but if you were to look at the real and imaginary parts, they're switching energy, this complex field evolution. Here is what the spectrum of this thing looks like. So in other words, the Fourier transform of this is right here. So this localized sech produces something that looks like a localized sech in the frequency domain, and this is what its evolution looks like. So this is kind of a very generic and boring case. However, I solved it with 512 modes, and this is the entire point of the reduced order modeling framework, which is when you look at this data and you say, that looks like a very simple evolution. It's this wave that's just traveling. Maybe I could trade out to a coordinate system where instead of using 512 Fourier modes, I use the appropriate mode for doing the numerical solution with this, right? So instead of standing, I'm going to trade out bases. Trade out those Fourier modes for a better basis. And so I'm going to take this, do snapshots here, find the SV, do the SVD, look for the low rank sub subspace in which to project this data. Here's the n equals 2 case. What you're looking at here is the evolution. And the evolution is such that it's, it's, a, it's called a breather. So it's, this, it's, this, it's called a two soliton. It's a, it's a breathing structure. You can see it has this very nice complex Nonlinear dynamics, here's what its frequency domain counterpart looks like. So this is an interesting evolution. However, it still looks like a fairly simple dynamics, right? Just kind of a breathing structure that's happening there. And so, again, you can ask the question, 
I, I could solve this obviously with using my Fourier decomposition like I just did with 512 modes, or can I trade out to a more appropriate basis in which I can use significantly less number of modes, okay? So, because these, you know, the, these functions don't look like Fourier modes at all, right? I mean, Fourier modes are these global structures, sines and cosines. Uh, these are highly localized. And, of course, what Fourier th theory tells you is that you can represent any function on a 2 pi periodic domain with an infinite sum of sines and cosines. But the whole point is I'm trying to stay away from the infinite sum and make it as small a sum as possible. And Fourier modes are not the best set of modes to use for such dynamics. So what we can do is we can take that data, put them in a snapshot matrix, SVD. This is exactly what we did in the last lecture. I talked about this. You just take this, you look for the low dimensional embedding. And what I'm showing you here is the results from these two simulations. So top left, top right. This is the n equal one soliton, n equal two soliton. And what you're looking at here is the energy, the variance percentage, or the energy contained in each of the modes if I look at the singular value decay. So I'm looking at the sigma matrix for those two simulations on a log plot. And you can see right here, the yellow, there's one mode that dominates in that n equal soliton, n equal one soliton case. And all the other modes are down here. I've color coded them. So the first mode is yellow. Second is magenta, third is cyan. But you can see everybody else is down here. And by the way, why is it not zero? Well, because I have numerical round off. OD45 is taking time steps that are around 10 minus 5, 10 minus 6. And that's kind of what you're seeing here is this is sort of from your numerical scheme. Over here, interestingly enough, when you do this, look what happens. Instead of having a single mode off of the singular value decay spectrum here, you have five modes up here. In fact, in fact, two of the modes really dominate, and then there's the third mode that has about a couple percentage of the energy, and the other two, which have even less. So two modes have about, you know, in the high 90s percentages of the total variance. So it's telling you a lot about the structure that's there and about the dimensionality of what's actually in there. What I've also done is plotted the modes. In other words, the columns of the U matrix coming from the SVD from taking those 21 snapshots and I look at the first three modes, uh, first three columns of U. So the first one are the first three columns for this n equals one case. So first of all, you see this nice yellow here, that's the first mode. And in fact, it looks exactly like the solution that we saw right here. It's a bump. So it's actually saying that's the dominant correlated structure. Everything else is very small. That's what this interpretation of that mode being way up here, everything being down here, and that's its shape. Interestingly enough, if you look at these two modes and you look, if you look at those two modes that have very little correlation uh, in the system or very little energy in the system, here they are. That's the magenta and blue. It's absolute garbage. This is all from numerical round off. These are not real. They're numerical artifacts. So it's really important when you think about doing rank truncation that you look carefully at what you're getting out of these things. Because in this case, if you were to try to now build a model off these three modes, using the extra, the second and third mode actually does worse for you than just using one mode alone. Okay, but this tells you you should just use one mode. You should truncate right there. Use that one mode, forget the rest. Okay, this is what this is suggesting to you. Now, this bottom picture says that these are these modes. Now, they are not negligible. They are actually getting some significant portion of the variance. And here's what they look like. The first mode is yellow, which you might expect. There's a bump structure in there. But notice the magenta and cyan are these two extra modes that are actually capturing a bit of the energy. Uh, the, about 97, 98% of the total variance is in mode one and two. So in fact, we could build a model just off of two modes and get most of it right. In fact, I'm gonna show you this in a moment. So this is the interpretation we have from getting data like this. And this is exactly what, you know, this is a very simple model. Let me just say that out front, right? This is just a toy example. 
But what you do in reduced order modeling is you do simulations of a high fidelity system. So this is what these are equivalent to. 512 modes, well resolved, I do the simulation for a fixed amount of time. From these, these are my snapshots, I find a low dimensional embedding space. And I find that by doing this kind of analysis here, where I look at the singular value spectrum, I look at what kind of mode structures I have, and then I find for myself a way to say, well, I can now project that PDE into this subspace. And how I'm going to do it, of course, is through that formula right here. So I'm going to go ahead and project, take inner products, get an equation of motion. So let's do it for this system here. So let's start off with this simple case. Then equals one case. And in this case, uh, what you're going to do is there's only one mode, so I'm going to say AFT phi of x. There's one phi of x, which is that yellow bump. And I'm just going to throw this directly into the PDE. And then take the inner products with respect to phi of x again. Because remember, the phi of x, it's an, it's, you know, it has, it's, you don't have any, you only have one direction, which is phi of x, if you do a one mode expansion, but it it's, has a length unity. So we're going to go ahead and take the inner product and we're going to find the governing equations. So in fact, here they are. If you do this, you plug that formula in, take the inner product, this is the governing equation for the amplitude of that mode. IAFT, alpha over 2A, beta, mod A squared A. So notice it's a differential equation, not a partial differential equation, for one variable, A, and that coefficients alpha and beta determine from the inner product that you have to, that you do once you've actually expanded your solution. And so here they are. So now notice that I'm taking inner product with respect to the second derivative of phi. I'm taking inner product with respect to the nonlinear contribution, the mod squared phi phi. Okay, so these are these two coefficients that you have here. Now the nice thing about having a model like this, I just turned my PDE now into a one-dimensional ODE, and at least in this specific case, I can write down a closed form solution, and here it is, AFT. You can solve that nonlinear ODE, and here's its solution. It's given explicitly by here, where A0 is the initial condition of A. And you can find that just by projecting your data onto uh, the initial condition uh, at time zero. So in total, given that A of t, and knowing that the solution was A of t times phi of x, my overall solution U of x t then is just glue those together. If here's your A of t times phi of x. That is, in fact, so in this case, I've done one, I've done one step further, which is I was able to show you, by the way, you can actually work this out completely analytically. Here's my reduced order model. I solved a, a single nonlinear differential equation to tell you exactly the evolution dynamics uh, over time of the nonlinear system in that subspace V of X. Okay, so this is this is exactly the whole idea of the the reduced order modeling, which is I went from a system that had 512 Fourier modes down to a system with a single ODE describing. So right, I shaded out a five by 512 degree. 512 differential equations to one. And that one, by the way, I could solve so I can write down the solution. Okay, so that is a two orders of magnitude reduction in, in terms of the size of what I'm doing. Let's now go and turn our attention to the n equals two. The n equals two, of course, let's go back and look at it. For the n equals 2, there is some question about whether you would want to do a two-mode expansion, a three-mode expansion, maybe four or five. And in fact, they're, they're all they're equally easy to do in some sense. So I either would trade it out to you know, solving two ODEs up to five ODEs. Uh, not a big deal. What I'm going to show you is if I do a two-mode expansion, because I want to show you exactly what the analytics look like. So it's basically going to expand in a subspace, subspace spanned by this yellow and magenta mode. So imagine those two modes interacting with different frequencies and if you look at the combination of them and imagine a sinusoidal type behavior in time, if they oscillate against each other you'll see this breathing behavior and that's exactly what we can get in this reduced order model. Okay. 
So let's go back here, sorry, and here it is. So now if you're gonna do a two mode expansion, here it is. The two modes are phi one and phi two. They each have their own amplitude, A1 and A2. So since you now find phi one and phi two from this data-driven approach, that's your subspace. Now you just have to find A1 and A2. And you do that by putting this back into the governing equations, first taking in a product with respect to phi one and using orthogonality. Phi one and phi two are orthogonal to each other. And then you also take the inner product with respect to phi 2, make use of orthogonality, and you get two coupled nonlinear differential equations, one for A1, one for A2. And here they are. So this is obviously more complicated, but it's, you know, this is a pretty simple ODE to run. You have to compute all these coefficients, and they're all computed from taking inner products. So you do it all up front. Once you have it, it's trivial to simulate. It's two by two of a system. You can do phase plane analysis. There's a lot of stuff you can do with this because now you have this, this is your reduced order model. So I traded out, again, a 512 degree of freedom system down to a two by two system, nonlinear ODEs. Simulate this for the dynamics of A1 and 2. Then glue it back into here and you have your solution. That's your reduced order model. So hopefully what this uh, example has shown you is sort of this very simple architecture to get you from a simulation space of a high dimensional simulation, which you're still forced to do, right? The, the point is you still have to do some high fidelity, high dimensional simulation, but you do it for a while to find snapshots that you can use to build yourself your low dimensional embedding space. You move into that low dimensional embedding space and now you can simulate at a fraction of the cost, right? Because this is an R rank subsystem of this N dimensional system. This is much easier to simulate. So you would simulate that out. And then at some point you lose, you, your model starts to become poor. You have to go back up to the high dimensional simulation collect data again, find a subspace, project down. So that's typically how it's done. The other thing that's interesting about this is oftentimes these ROMs aren't used for, to make qualitative or quantitative agreement with the actual high dimensional model. So for instance, a lot of times these ROMs are used for Monte Carlo purposes to get statistics. So for instance, if you want to calculate lift on a turbulent flow, you really want the statistics of the turbulent flow to compute that lift. So the idea is with the reduced order modeling, even, even if it's not quantitatively accurate to your full high fidelity model, as long as it, you can run this cheaply and it produces the correct statistics, you can do it at a fraction of the cost. Moreover, some of these high dimensional models, you have no shot of doing Monte Carlo. They're just too expensive, too big. So you need the proxy model, which is low dimensional, to do lots of simulations to generate some of these statistical properties that you want to use in doing modeling. More can be found here, databookuw.com, all the code I used, lecture notes, and, and lots more on reduced order modeling and, uh, and, and uh, these POD methods.